Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's program. I'm Mark Trowbridge. I'm the president of the Coral Gables Chamber of Commerce and one of today's partners in We the Possibility, a virtual lunch featuring Mitchell Weiss in conversation with Rebecca Fishman Lipsy. Now, I hope all of you are uh, ready for a great program. And on behalf of not only our Coral Gables Chamber of Commerce, we want to thank our friends at the Miami Foundation, Harvard Business Review Press, and of course, our partners in the chamber, First Citizens Bank, a shout out to our good friend, Sarah Hernandez. Today's program is gonna be a conversation, but our chat will be enabled so that you can ask questions of Rebecca and Mitchell, and I'll be back shortly to help you with that and moderate that part, part of the program. I also wanna remind you that in the green tab just below me, you see that you can buy We the Possibility and any other book at Books and Books that you would like to purchase. Do that today and support not only our local businesses, but our independently owned bookshops like Books and Books. They are more than a bookstore. They are a collaborator, a community convener, and today a great partner in what we are doing in bringing you We the Possibility. Once again, I just want to remind all of you to engage and join in today's program. Thanks for being part of this ongoing virtual book club, not only in our Chamber of Commerce, but in the partnership that we are blessed to have with Books and Books and so many others. It's going to be a great afternoon and a great start to your weekend. And so now we present We the Possibility, Harnessing Public Entrepreneurship to Solve Our Most Urgent Problems by Mitchell Weiss. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to bring the CEO of the Miami Foundation on board with us today. She is going to be leading the conversation with Mitchell Weiss. Welcome, Rebecca Fishman Lipsy. Rebecca? It's great to see you, Mark. What a great intro. And how you doing, Mitch? Thanks for bringing us some winter weather. Well, I'd rather be where you are than where I am, Rebecca. That's the truth. Everybody should be here. Miami's on fire right now. But I am so excited to dive in to this book with you today. So it's my pleasure to be with you, this incredible audience, with all of our partners. You picked a heck of a topic and a heck of a time to, to launch this book. Uh, why don't we start right at the beginning? Uh, you picked a really heart-wrenching story to start your book with. It was about the uh, attacks at the 2013 Boston Marathon. I'm curious, writing a book about possibility and you started there. Why'd you start there? Well, for anyone that's been in Boston on that day, you know it's the best day of the year in Boston and, and that it was shattered in an instant. Um, but, but one of the things that happened afterwards was that all the generosity starts to flow in from around the world. And then the question is, what do we do with that generosity? All this money is coming in. People want to help. What do we do with it? And then the normal thing people do um, when these horrible attacks happen is the local established foundation in town, um, you know, somebody like the Miami Foundation uh, uh, collects and distributes these funds. But we had also happened to know that that was very slow, that uh, in many cases that took weeks or even months or years to get the money to the people who needed it. It had been more than 120 days since the horrible shootings at Sandy Hook. Not a penny had made it to those parents. It was never going to bring their kids back, but it was intended for them. And so we decided to start our own new fund. Um, we were told uh, the very next morning that uh, that we couldn't do that, uh, um, that we were making a mistake. We'd raise less money. Government can't do new things. And we did anyways. We got started on a PayPal account in a post office box. We collected and dist distributed $60 million in 75 days. Um, a year later, Rebecca, two survivors asked me to tell a long version of that story uh, to them, how that all came to be. And I, I said, it's not my story to tell. I didn't get hurt um, uh, after they asked me to tell to others. And uh, they said, but you have to, you have to tell others because you have to show them that government can do new things. So that was the question I was left with uh, uh, for a long while, which is, well, was it what the foundation head had said, which we can't do new things? Is it what the survivors who witnessed, which, which is what we can? And that was, the, that was the question, you know, can government do new things that set me out to write this book? And so that's why I started there. Got it. So can government do new things? And you, you talk a bit about this concept of a possibility government. You know, we have a probability government. You want to see us shift to a possibility government. Maybe explain a bit about what each of those is and give some examples about what does a, a possibility government look like? I think we have probability government in many places. And um and what that is, is basically government doing things that will uh, work, but but sort of achieve middling or mediocre outcomes if we're being clear-eyed about it. 
And I do think we need to move in more places to trying things that are new. Uh, but by, by virtue of their novelty, they only might work. They, they might only possibly work, which means they probably won't work, which I know is like a very scary proposition to offer up these days. But I really do believe that in more instances and in more places, we need to move towards possibility if we're going to solve the problems that face us. And, you know, what does that look like in earnest? Um, I mean, take, uh, take something like COVID um, and think about all the tried and true mechanisms we have for fighting pandemics, of which there are, um, uh, but they're not up to the task, really, of fighting this pandemic, of fighting it fast enough. And then think about uh, two women um, in, in Boston, actually, um, Mariana Matus, Nusha Gailey, started a, a, an effort to basically gather uh, data from sewage, including eventually COVID uh, data from sewage. I'm going to the government saying, hey, you know what? The way to uncover COVID in your community isn't the old way we do testing, isn't the new way we do testing, is like the new, new way. We do it, which is to sniff it out of your uh, sewage, if you will, out of the waste in the community. Now, that's probably not going to work at the beginning. That's probably not going to work. But honestly, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be those kinds of things that we need to pursue so that we can actually solve this problem and so many other problems. Nusha and Mariana are having success, I think, in so many other places. If governments took on this mentality, we could, we could tackle things like COVID, like schooling, like hunger, like poverty, like so many other things. Wow. So bold concept, not just for government, but really for any kind of leadership. How do we get more innovative? Uh, how do we get more fast in our response? So I would argue you need to have an appetite for risk in order to do that. And the question is, like, do we, do we give permission to our government to take risk right now um, and to fail? And so I'm curious, what it would take to allow government to take, to fail a little bit? Well, I think you're right that a lot of it is on us. <clears throat> like we are going to have to grant as members of the public, we are going to have to grant that permission and even that encouragement. And eventually actually our co-participation, if they're going to try really new things, they're going to need our help. So I, I agree that uh, we, the public have a lot to do with it. You know, we, the possibility. Um, I think also uh, people in public life, elected officials, appointed officials are going to ha have to take on um, this. I don't know actually that they need to uh, take on more risk. Because I think that what they're doing right now, oftentimes, by not trying new things, is also a risky choice, right? The status quo is often risky. It doesn't maybe look risky if you don't look at it hard enough or feel risky if you pay not attention to it. But it is risky. When kids aren't graduating from schools, when families aren't eating, that's risky. So I think what it's going to take is, is convincing people that often the status quo is the risky choice, that trying something new is not inherently, therefore, riskier. And then empowering uh, public leaders with the skills to take on new projects without taking on more risk. And that's a lot of what the lessons are in the book is about how you try new things without actually taking on, on more risk. That's really interesting. So you talk a bit about like best practice finding as kind of the status quo. It's like it seems as if it's less risky because you're looking around and you're seeing what's everybody else doing and let's just take the best of that. And that if you do that, you, you actually never really push the needle. So. I mean, and you probably experienced this a bit in your own work in the mayor's office. Maybe talk a bit about times where you could have gone for a best practice, but you you chose to push. I mean, I remember vividly, um, we in Boston were facing a housing crunch like so many cities were, an affordability crisis as so many cities were. And I asked the team, you know, what, um, what can we do about affor affordable housing? You know, um, making sure people can live here and move here. And they came back with a list of basically what other cities were doing. And I, I'm not going to name the cities, but like I, I wouldn't have put them, at, you know, I wouldn't have said they had solved the problem of affordable housing. In fact, in many cases, quite the opposite. So the kind of I love I love my team, but kind of the pushback to them is like, well, why would I go do that? Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, we ex we haven't solved the problem in, uh, of affordable housing in Boston either, but we experimented with other ways of doing it. We were sort of on the early edge of sort of micro housing and co-housing and you know, I remember actually one day we had gotten some developers to go out to a, 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 a vacant parts of land and take basically masking tape and mock out what a little micro unit would look like. So we could think about whether this was a this was a way to basically solve the problem. I'm not saying it was or wasn't, but at least it was something different from what everybody else was doing so that we had a fighting chance at solving the real problem. Hmm. That's really interesting. I mean, we have so many issues pressing on us right now. And so do you think it would make problem solving faster to go this way? Or do you think you'd end up going down lots of different rabbit holes? Well, that's a real challenge. I don't want to paper over the fact that if we do open ourselves up to many more ideas, which I think we should, 
we're going to get some bad ideas along with the good ones. And one of the skill set of public leaders in the public is going to be sorting through uh, the bad ones from the good ones, figuring out how to test them quickly so we don't end up down uh, many rabbit holes. So it's not a distraction. But I do believe, actually, if we took this possibility approach, we would deliver public so solutions quicker. I mean, imagine, I mean, you have experience in this, and I'm sure many of the of the people gathered here today do, seeing government take three and four and five and 10 and 15 and 35 years to solve a problem because of all the commissions and the committees and the consultants and the conference rooms. And by the time the solution is delivered, it's actually not even tuned to the problem as, as it is anymore. And so I do think if we developed a, a faster methodology for putting solutions into, into the public, for getting feedback on them, for making them better, we would solve problems more rapidly than we do today. I do. That, that's really interesting. And it's true. You know, I, I think if I want something done fast, I'm not thinking I want to go call up the government to see if they can help solve my problem. I expect it to, you know, becomes very costly and very time intensive. And you're right, by the time the solution comes out, it's not relevant to what's even happening anymore. And I think right now, I don't know whether we're at an all-time low, but we're at a low in terms of trust in, in institutions and in government. Um, and so it's an interesting moment for a book like this to come out and say, wait, you know, uh, maybe we should even be more, more bold in this moment. Uh, so talk to us a bit about COVID. And you mentioned this a little bit earlier. So we, we are facing an economic, social health crisis that many of us have never lived through before um, in any uh, capacity. And we're trying to solve for all these issues uh, at the same time. What do you wish the government was doing right now? Frankly, I think um, we have seen so much invention and entrepreneurship on the way here that when I when I say I, we need more of it, I want to just be clear, like I, I'm amazingly proud and, and admiring of many public leaders, especially at the state and local level, who leapt in uh, in the early parts of last year to invent new ways to keep people housed, to, to keep them uh, fed, uh, to try to keep them educated. And so, so much entrepreneurship has happened on the part of the public sector and their partners that that even though we're not where we want to be, we'd be much worse if that hadn't happened. But what would I like to have seen or see now? Still much more invention and experimentation than we have. I don't know why. I mean, I know I have some you know notions about why, but why when it comes to getting kids back in school, we can't experiment with hundreds of ways of trying it and, and not have, you know, committees spent all summer long on just one way to get the kids in school? Why, when it comes to getting businesses open and supported, can't we think outside the box of ways they can be open and, 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 and be with their customers? Why, when it comes to the vaccine, frankly, and the goal of getting to 300 million plus Americans, can we not be more, were we not more inventive uh, in thinking about how to do this rapidly? I mean, if we had just taken the same approach to delivering the vaccine as we had to discovering the vaccine, well, we would be moving much faster right now. When we set out to discover the vaccine, right, dozens of companies working on hundreds of potential uh, uh, vaccines, knowing that most of them won't work, but that if half a dozen did at the end, it would save lives and rescue our economy. Why couldn't we have the same imagination? And we still can actually, when it comes to delivering the vaccine. What are the next 100 ways uh, we can actually deliver the vaccine quicker? Uh, I know that the first 97 of them won't be wise, but the, but the last three, the best three, might in fact make sure that everybody gets it sooner rather than later. One of my favorite tweets on that uh, was, I think someone wrote, if we just got Amazon Prime to be on this, we'd all be vaccinated by Wednesday. And I thought to myself, you know, it's very interesting what the role is of government partnering with business in this moment. So how do you see that interplay? Well, it's very fraught. Um, I observe in the book and, uh, and in my work that over the last decade or so, there actually has been quite a coming together of government and technology companies to solve big public problems. And technologists, many technologists going in, uh, originally uh, in the Obama White House, actually many more staying even afterwards. Uh, and, and now again, we see that people coming out of government, going to work in technology firms, all of them coming together to solve public problems. Um, but there's also been a coming apart. There's a kind of, I call it, um, you know, there was this thing in the world that, that was described as tech lash. And I think there's now a tech for good lash. There's a pushback on these technology companies wanting to solve public problems, in part because of what the technology companies did. They violated our privacy, they threatened our autonomy, you know, they exacerbated inequality. And then when they come in and say, we want to help solve public problems, people are, I think, rightly skittish. But the fact of the matter is we need the help of these skills, of these practices, of, of some of their um, their just their sheer capacity if we're going to solve the problems that we have today. So. Um, do I think that Amazon could come in and help with this? Yes. Would we want to make sure that if they did, they adopted some of our public mores and didn't dump all their private interests on us? 
yes, would uh, you know, would we want to make sure that we didn't adopt all, all, all of their mentality? Um, of course. When I talk about public entrepreneurship, I don't mean just taking private entrepreneurship and injecting it wholesale into the public sector. But there's a lot more work that we could do together if we learn from each other and respect each other's uh, good values. It's a really good distinction. So let's talk about talent a little bit. Do you think, I mean, surely there are, and I know many of them, really innovative people who are working in government right now. Uh, I don't know that they feel that they're working in the capital of innovation for our country. Uh, do you think something needs to shift to get highly talented, innovative people to go into the sector and then to actually be able to be innovative in the sector? Yes. I mean, there's a trend in at, the, at, at, at all levels of government in this country and in other countries where we are seeing this movement of, of talent, which is great. And I think there's more that can be do that can be done to elevate that, to attract people into government, not permanently, maybe just for what are called tours of duty. Maybe you spend a year or two uh, working to uh, fix health care in your in your city or to sol help solve the home, uh, you know, the housing problem in your city. And maybe you go back to what you were doing. You can lead a life as a tri sector entrepreneur moving between um, public, private, and not-for-profit and not for profit ventures. I absolutely think that more can be done to attract those people in, and more are. Cities, counties, states, the federal government have fellowship programs, digital service agencies. You've undertaken, a, a, actually in Miami, an effort to ramp up on, on digital services. That's gonna attract people in, into government. Uh, at the same time, we should do uh, what you alluded to, Rebecca, which is invite people who are already there, out of the woodwork, to work on these new problems. There are amazing people in public life with, with talent and ideas and creativity. And what we need are for our leaders to raise expectations, to say we can't affect solve public problems anymore. We need your help, we need your ideas. Invite them out, give them some of that permission to try and even fail. And if we get that mix, the people that are there with the expertise, the people that are new uh, with some of the new skill set, and, and have them work together, I do think we can solve the challenges that face us. Amen to that. So let's get wonky for a second. You just dropped the term tri-sector entrepreneur. <laughs> Is that what you said? We okay. can get wonkier. <laughs> so we're going to get wonkier. So I, I think I remember a chapter in this book where you got into that. And the example that you gave, I loved because it, it rang so true to me, was about uh, Obamacare and the rollout of the healthcare uh, and I remember this happening, everybody, you know, watching with bated breath for what was going to be a revolution within the healthcare uh, offerings for our country. And then it unleashes, and I think six people were able to sign up and the site crashes. Uh, and so it was kind of a moment of great innovation that spectacularly blew up. Uh, and then you went in in that example and talked about tri-sector entrepreneurs. So go in a little bit there. What, what were some of the lessons from that moment? And what were you getting at in the concept of the tri-sector entrepreneur? I mean, it is this amazing moment, Rebecca, right? The signature domestic power achievement, one that the president's party had been fighting for for generations. It's finally accomplished and then almost ruined by a technology failure. Um, by the way, it's not the only place this happens. So, so out of this though, the seeds of, of uh, attracting new, new talent out of the woodwork and in and from the outside are born. Uh, programs um, in the White House, like the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program, uh, 18F, the US Digital Service, all these new efforts to try to bring uh, talent in are born out of this. So, 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 so eventually, first of all, healthcare.gov gets rescued. Um, and new programs uh, get created to make sure things like this don't happen again. But what I was gonna say, Rebecca, is it's not the only place this happened. Uh, there's a thing called the Government Digital Service in the UK, which was one of their efforts. In fact, it preceded our US Digital Service effort to kind of bring this mentality into government. It was born out of a failure of a healthcare technology deployment. There's like a contagion of like countries, you know, uh, rolling these big tech projects out and especially in healthcare horribly and having them not work. So why did it happen? Uh, part of it is uh, government built with some old mentality about how stuff gets built, including technology stuff. You know, uh, very uh, lots of planning, lots of bureaucracy, not a lot of testing with with, uh, with uh, the users, um, not a lot of good product management, uh, not a lot of people interfacing between the technologists and the policy people and the citizens. Um, uh, that's been remedied in so many instances now uh, by our government, and I think it will mean a better. Um, uh, better things ahead, but it's just an example of, we need to attract some people in, we need them to go back out and build new product. We need to attract people out of the woodwork. If we all live these lives, um, uh, helping out when we can on the topics when we can with the skills we have, we can make a big difference. So I sit over here in the philanthropic 
hot seat. I run our community's foundation and it's interesting to hear where you started and we're kind of inspired by trying to figure out how to give as nimbly as possible. I think about that all the time as well. And for us here, we have um, annually, we have to think through kind of emergency fundraising and deployment of resources because of hurricane season. Uh, and so we've gotten pretty darn good at it here in Miami, but I'm curious to hear your take. Uh, you talked a little bit before about kind of the interplay of government and business, uh, but what's the philanthropic role? What do you want to see us doing? Well, I think it would be amazing if you continued to be um, if, if great innovators and uh, in some instances seed capital for public innovation. Um, one of the one of the great examples of this is public libraries that Carnegie had funded as a matter of philanthropy and then became so popular that government started funding. There are other examples of this like this 911, uh, other examples of like this. And I think that philanthropy can continue to be seed capital for stuff that eventually becomes um, uh, publicly supported. But but I don't think that a philanthropist should say to government, just leave it to us. I think that would be a giant mistake for at least mm -hmm. two reasons. One is the, the long track record on philanthropy for being as innovative as you want to be is not actually that strong. Um, there are uh, exceptions, and um, you're leading some of that work. There's actually, there are some amazing other uh, philanthropic leaders these days. Turns out, I think they all happen to be uh, women. Um, maybe they're just more entrepreneurial that way, um, who are who are leading a revolution in philanthropy. But the long history of, of philanthropy uh, over the last couple of decades is not that it's been as innovative as it aspires to be. It's it somehow turns out that people who make money as entrepreneurs tend to give it away less entrepreneurially. So I think saying to the government, "Leave it to us," would be a mistake. In addition, Rebecca. I think you're going to need partners in government who want to work as agilely and as, as, as nimbly as you uh, so that you're going to want these the skill set and this mentality in government. So when you're working on housing or when you're working on hurricane recovery or whatever else it is, you have partners who are sort of, um, you know, uh, reading from the same book. I don't mean that literally, uh, although that'd be fine, too. Um, uh, so yeah, that I've got a recommendation. <laughs> you can all try, you know, you can all try new things together. Yeah. It's been really interesting, especially when leaders of business, philanthropy and government are friends and work with each other and collaborate with each other to put on the table big problems and say, okay, which of us is best poised to play what role in solving this problem? Uh, so for example, one of the major issues that was uh, revealed during uh, the, the, I guess the role of our COVID recovery was internet access. That at this point in society, especially when we're uh, in our homes for safety, if you don't have access to high quality internet in your house, it's as if being functionally illiterate in society. Uh, kids couldn't go to school, uh, job access opportunities, health opportunities, it, it just, it, it's debilitating. And so we've been working on figuring out what it takes to make sure every single family in our community has access to the internet. To your point, in the long term, we do believe that's something that should be offered through our government. We can't philanthropically solve that forever, but there are things we can do to jumpstart that, to invest quickly in that, build the knowledge, the expectation, uh, the framework for that, make it happen for a couple of years, and then shift it uh, towards a business solution or a government solution. So it's cool to hear you say that. And I, I take the push well, that we, we need to be honest about how innovative we are or can be in this moment. Hey, were there imaginative ideas that, that come up around uh, bridging the digital divide that, that you were able to deploy or that you hope to be able to deploy? Yeah, so I, it's been neat to see, I've been talking to my colleagues across the country about who's solving this issue right now. Uh, and so one of the first efforts was coming out of Chicago and we're, we're modeling something similar here where they just, they philanthropically uh, built a partnership. They used some CARES Act funding partnered with government, but they raised the funds to do four years of free internet access for every low income family in the community. It was a significant raise. They did it, we're doing it here in Miami. Uh, we've purchased 10,000 devices. We, I think we've secured enough funds to probably roll out in four neighborhoods for two years. Uh, and over the course of the next few months, we'll be growing that. Uh, but I think in the long term, that's not the win. The win is looking at other cities like Palm Beach County, which is to the north of us, that actually their government is working to become a public utility themselves and to provide internet access. And so we're learning from some of our peers about um, not just paying for the existing commodity, but figuring out how to make a new avenue for the resource. So we're working on it, uh, but it's it's a space where it's the triangle. We need government there, we need business there, we need philanthropy there, uh, and none of us could really solve it in a, in a serious way for the community by ourselves. Well, that's great. Well, good luck with it. I look forward to hearing how it unfolds. Oh, you will. I'll be <laughs> calling you for help. Uh, so I would love to hear a bit about your favorite parts in this book. And I remember when we were pre-gaming for this chat and I asked you this question, I was like, tell me your two or three favorite parts. And we got to like eight parts that were your favorite. Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll press you here, pick one or two. Um, 
Glad you like the book so much. Yeah, right. The, the um, well, uh, the, the, my favorite part of the book I didn't tell you about, but um, my actually at the very back of the book, my kids uh, each have a sentence um, and um, uh, about basically making the world a better place and, and fixing things. And I, I do hope the book inspires another generation of people. I think it's so um, sad that our young people have experienced the last couple of years and their image of government is one of uh, basically mistrust and, and uh, not delivering uh, to, to euphemize about it. And I would love I would love young people to believe that government can be so much more than they can be part of it. So I hadn't thought of it before you asked me, but, I, but maybe that's my very favorite part of the book. Um, there's a story in the book about mobile voting, which I find um, every time I read it, um, uh, sort of vexing because I still don't know how I feel about it. Uh, you know, this pilot came together in West Virginia between uh, Bradley Tusk, who had been one of Uber's first lobbyists, um, uh, this uh, Nimit Swani, who was an immigrant from India, who had seen people basically have to mo uh, vote uh, under coercion in his country um, in the 80s, and Mac Warner, who was a um, Republican Secretary of State of West Virginia. And they, they piloted an effort to do actually mobile voting, voting by your cell phone for people stationed overseas. And you, know, you can imagine why, right? If you're out defending your country, it would seem like uh, voting should be made easy for you, not hard. Uh, fax machines and, uh, and, and cables and a whole ma mailers and a whole host of other things. So any event, uh, the pilot goes off and people are um, excited about it and people are freaked out about it because the last thing you wanna do while the Russians are attacking our voting system, while other people are undermining our voting system is have mobile voting. And so this chapter is about whether we should or shouldn't have a mobile voting, whether we should or shouldn't experiment on democracy, what's fragile, you know, is, is its fragility precisely the reason to try new things or is it the reason to stay away? And so to me, maybe that's my favorite chapter because it's so alive right now after November, after January 6th, uh, what we're all trying to do in our community, this question of can we experiment on democracy? Uh, our founders were experimenters. Can we be, still be experimenters? Um, to me, is such a riddle and it's probably my favorite chapter in the book right now. I love that. It's even fun to hear you talk about it. I feel like, um, especially after a season of feeling people uh, feeling low about the state of our democracy, for you to inject a little bit of hope uh, and remind us that this is part of our core also uh, means a lot. So maybe my last question to you before I pass it to uh, to Mark to get questions from the from the audience is just about you, the author. You've had an interesting professional journey that led you here over at Harvard Business School and uh, in government yourself. But curious if you were to rewind back and just talk about you, the person who who birthed this book, uh, what were some of your early influences that, and I know we've got some some of your family uh, and some of your roots on the line too. So what, what were some of the early influences for you that, that brought you down this road? Um. Well, yeah, my family has had a huge influence on me. I mean, uh, the ethos of helping people, healing the world has always been a big thing in our household. My grandparents were, were doctors um, and um, uh, maybe I was too squeamish to go into surgery or something, but I think there are other ways to also heal. And so that's been a thing for me my whole life. I, I always wanted to be in public service. I, <laughs> I once dressed up as a voting booth for Halloween. I mean, it's, kind of been, a long, it's been a long time uh, thing for me. Um, so, uh, you know, my parents always taught me to be honest and to, uh, to care. Um, and I, and I, I, I think that's some of that's been, been, been bred into the book. Um, my wife um, is, uh, is a healer. Um, you know, my kids call her a feelings doctor. I mean, she helps humans every day. And so I, I think I'm just trying to do my part. Um, and um, that's probably why I wrote the book. I love it. Well, it's such a pleasure to talk to you about this. I loved reading the book. I'm excited for everyone tuning in to get a copy. Uh, and I'm going to pass it over to Mark to field some questions. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Mitchell, wonderful. What a great conversation. Um, I love the just easy nature of uh, the two of you, not only talking about this book, but just about possibilities. So we have a couple of questions in the chat, and I certainly want to invite the audience members who are with us here today. Uh, to place any additional questions in the chat, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, but I'll start with, is there room for organized religion to participate in solving problems? Religious organizations, even like the Knights of Columbus. Um, yes. So one of the first um, things we have to do if we're going to solve our big public problems, I think, is open up to people we haven't normally opened up to for ideas. 
And oftentimes that needs to be actually the people facing those problems, the citizens in our community. Um, oftentimes that could be so-called non-experts, uh, people from uh, fields further afar. Um, uh, I, I was just reminded yesterday of the story uh, when, of Southwest Airlines when they wanted to get better at, at turning around um, uh, of turning around airplanes. They didn't go and look at other airlines. To Rebecca's earlier point about best practices, they went and looked at NASCAR pit crews. So if we in government want to get better at delivering human service, why not go to one of the places that's been delivering really human service since there was humans, which is you know religious religious organizations. Uh, so I think we should look everywhere and anywhere uh, practically for uh, for new ideas. Absolutely. Thank you very much. A comment and a question. It says, "Congrats on the book, Mitchell." I have quote from probability to possibility on a sticky note over my desk. My question is. 2020 has shown all of us again how our systems are rooted in whiteness, white norms, harmful norms rooted in capitalism instead of attracting people in. Can the move to possibility be turning things over to poor people, marginalized people, black people? Should race be discussed here? Seems like moving to possibility means radically redistributing power and the risk to fail. Please share your thoughts. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Diversity has to be a huge part of moving towards possibility. And one of the best champions I've ever heard for possibility, uh, I tell his story in the first chapter of the book. And um, he might not be the person you'd think would champion this kind of thing. He is a, you know, he's a, he's a military leader, a white male military leader. He makes one of the strongest cases for diversity um, that you can. And he's adamant, adamant. If we're going to solve the biggest problems that face us, we need uh, we need all sorts of perspectives. He has this thing he says, uh, James Gertz, which is that, um, actually I met him in Tampa um, when he was at, at uh, the Special Operations Command there. And he says, look, here's the thing in government, which is we um, pick people who are like us to work on problems. And, the, and, and there's a lot of issues with that. And one of those issues is um, we in government are experts in what's happened already. And we need people who are gonna be experts in the future. He said, the problem is ducks pick ducks. And it turns out what we need are not ducks. So uh, we, we need to open up to, to everybody's perspective, have a much more diverse perspective at the table. It will absolutely be essential to solving problems anymore. We also need to get proximate to people to understand the issues they face, all people. Um, that will help us, uh, in, to use Brian Stevenson's words. So um, in so many instances, I do think possibility government means opening up to, uh, to everyone. I, Mel, Melvin Carter, who's the mayor of St. Paul, um, you know, says government will really, really work when the we and we the people means all of us. And I really believe that's true about we the possibility. Very nice. Thank you. So here's one that brings you right to home. It says there are two Harvard's Young American Leaders Program, YALP, alums in the final three for Chattanooga mayor right now. Voting begins, by the way, if you're in Chattanooga in five days. Any advice? a la We the Possibility for them as they look at the potential of the next four to eight years in office. And then there's going to be a bonus question. So I'll let you start there and I'll ask you the bonus on the other side. Okay, well, I'll I'll give some advice. And then Rebecca is also an alum of this great program. So maybe she can give some advice. Yeah, you gave a little pump there. I don't know if you saw it. <laughs> I saw it. I saw it. It, it. it looked like it was coming out of your head, Mark, but uh, I did see it. <laughs> I've got no, enough um, problems. <laughs> um, <clears throat> if you become the new mayor of Chattanooga, um, First, open yourself up to new ideas. Um, absolutely, uh, as we've been talking about. Then commit yourself to finding ways to try those new ideas uh, to, and, and to get started on trying them relatively quickly. Harness the energy while it's there. Build, measure, learn your way through your solutions. Don't wait three or four years to get your stuff done. Um, and, and, then, and then, if you can do those things, have new ideas and try them, make sure you have a way to scale them so they can help everybody. If the programs aren't working, stop them. If they're working, invest more in them. We have too many little dangly pilot programs hanging around our cities that aren't helping very many people. And what we want to do is invest in stuff that's working and, and stop the stuff that's not and, and, and make sure we reach everybody. That'd be my advice for them. New ideas, try new things, scale those things that work. So here's the bonus question. Wait, Rebecca didn't get to give her advice. 
Oh, Rebecca, yeah, I'm so sorry. By the way, I'm on it. So for those who aren't familiar with the Yelp program, it's funded by the Knight Foundation to bring 10 young leaders from 10 different cities into Harvard Business School for a week, really focused on that concept of the tri-sector entrepreneur. So it was philanthropic leaders, it was, um, it was business leaders, educational leaders, it was um, government leaders all together working in tribe to solve problems in their communities. And so I guess like my three takeaways that I would say, and congrats and hello to my uh, fellow Yelpers who are on the line, uh, is that to build your tribe, like to build and make sure that you have allies with you as you step into leadership uh, and not to try to do the work alone. Nobody does it alone. Um, and and also to be listening to the people uh, and steering your priorities. Uh, I'm seeing our local leaders work really hard to stay in tune right now with what the voice of the community is and to make sure that you know at every moment that you're there, that you represent not just the people who elected you, but everybody in your community. Those are my thoughts. Very nice. And then the bonus question also for both of you says, how can a federal elected official, such as a member of Congress, employ these ideas as well? There are um, uh, huge responsibilities that are falling, of course, in our federal government right now. And it might seem hard if you're a, a public official or a member of Congress to um, help on that front or shepherd possibility on that front. I'll give you one very specific thing. If you're a member of Congress, your hearings are generally designed, not generally, but oftentimes, to bring somebody who's screwed up something inside government and to basically skewer them. And if we want to try new things in government, we need to orient at least our hearings somewhat in a somewhat different way. When someone comes up in front of you and the program they built didn't work, instead of initially skewering them, ask them, did you uh, learn a lot from what you did? Did you hopefully not spend too much money, waste too much public treasure getting there? Um, did you hopefully not waste too much time getting there? If if they didn't if they didn't spend too much money and they didn't spend too much time and they learned a lot and that learning can be spread, then um, invite them to port that learning to to some other uh, venue and solve public problems for us and 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 maybe to some extent stop playing the gotcha game in congressional hearing rooms and get and get us to real pro public problem solving. Rebecca, I'll add a hell yes to what you just said. <laughs> hell yes. <laughs> Please use the word skewer as often as possible. <laughs> your, your vernacular is so uh, incredibly delicious. I just want to tell you that. Thank we you. have another question, and this one comes from Alejandro. It says, the current administration is pushing for a $1.9 trillion stimulus plan. What are your thoughts? And is this possibility government or probability government? How to properly discern, discern between the two? Well, I think that um, we it, it, we need this help. Our communities need this help. Our cities and our states need this help. And so I'm glad to see this plan, uh, a plan moving forward. I think if you wanted to put a possibility lens on top of a plan, I would invite people to think about it in two ways, which is one, in $1.9 trillion of spending, some stuff is going to go wrong. How are we going to regard that when it does? Are we going to go back and say this was all ill-advised? We shouldn't have done this. Are we gonna turn that into a weapon for basically public service and public health? Or are we gonna say, you know what? The cost of doing $1.9 trillion worth of somewhat new stuff is gonna be that some of it doesn't work. And we're willing to tolerate some of it. Again, so long as it wasn't wasted, it was using the purpose of learning. There was accountability for learning for it. So let's not use it as a cudgel over government if in fact uh, most of it helped and, and the stuff that didn't was, was adjusted and adapted. And, and secondly, Let's make this the beginning, but not the end of trying new things in the new administration. Um, right. I, I've sort of been saying, look, uh, yes, there's the first 100 days. But what about the next 100 ways? Like what are the other 100 ways we're basically going to go um, about every single problem that faces this country? The new president has a, has a several key pillars solving uh, uh, the issue of, of climate sustainability, uh, racial inequity, obviously COVID the economy, on each one, there's a hundred ways we should be, or more, we should be thinking about solving these problems. Let's make this activity not be the, um, of course, the end of that, but the, but, but, the, but the new beginning about really fixing these problems. Fantastic, thank you. Kind of in the same vein, it says, you know, how much pu pushback do you perceive from people who only see government as a problem and would balk every time at this very concept? Plenty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, and honestly, um, I, I want to be clear, um, some of that pushback is, 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 is more than warranted. 
um, people are smart. They look around and they see that their government hasn't solved their problems. And so uh, they do worry about uh, about whether, uh, you know, in inviting them to be more adventurous is really the answer. I, I understand that. I think that's reasonable. Um, I, I think we have to uh, basically say, look, though, tap back into our history. Um, you know, the, I, the notion that government can't invent is not historically true. It's not. Government was invented. Every apparatus of government was invented. We were experimenters from the start. So when I hear that pushback, I welcome it. I think it's good to be critical about it. I think we shouldn't be naive to some of the dangers of this. We've seen instead of possibility in cases, we've seen delusion. I don't, I'm not advocating for delusion. We do need to sort between the two. So the pushback is well earned in many cases. It's warranted in many cases. But let's 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 say, look, history says we have experimented. Um, there's plenty of instances in the present that say we can't experiment. And so I would invite people to, to actually find the corners where we can make the progress and change the change the story. Fantastic. This is sort of a big picture question. And uh, Rebecca kind of chatted with this, Hugh, about discussion of your idea for this book. But what do you see next? What are the future endeavors? Obviously, you're teaching and you're involved in a variety of activities. What's next? Um, one of the one of the questions on my mind these days is about um, essentially what people call systems entrepreneurship. So I've been pretty focused on you know, the sort of the individual as the entrepreneur, right? In, this, in the earlier stories, Anusha, Mariana, uh, Melvin Carter, James Gertz, uh, all these people in the book, their, their individual stories, or in some cases, their organizations, Softworks, uh, Lab CDMX in Mexico City, uh, led by Gabriela Gomez Mont. And I, I think, uh, I mean, this isn't an original thought to me per se, but um, at all. But if we're going to really solve our big problems, this goes to Rebecca's earlier point. It's not going to be about one individual or about one organization. It's not going to be the hero entrepreneur. It's going to be, be about many, many entrepreneurs in public, in private, pulling each on their own levers. And so I'm very interested in the idea of systems entrepreneurship. How if we're going to fix democracy? How if we're going to rescue the climate? How if we're going to um, solve real deep entrenched issues of systemic racism? Do we engage in that in, in sort of a, how, how do we take a systems approach to it? In a, in a, and how do entrepreneurs think of themselves as being part of a bigger thing, not you know the centerpiece of the bigger thing, if you will? That's what's on my mind lately. Um, that's what's on my mind. Um, well, I can think about what's on my mind right now. It's not quite that heady, so I appreciate <laughs> that, and I appreciate the question because I think it gives folks a direction of what's next for for Mitchell Weiss. Um, I want to remind folks we still have some time, and if you want to put some questions in the chat, we'll be glad to get to them. Mitchell, next it says, can you comment on problems of continuity in leadership due to elected officials changing every few years? Maybe that relates to term limits or other types of natural turnover. Yeah, this is one of the this is one of the issues people raise when they say, like, we can't do new things because as soon as we get started, you know, someone else is is in office, um, and uh, that that's true. I guess we have turnover in in public life. Um, I think that problem is over described. Uh, first of all, we have turnover in lots of other places too, and they also still manage to solve, you know, problems or uh, undertake entrepreneurship. Secondly, we also have lots of not turnover in government. I mean, I worked for a mayor that that, that served for twenty years, <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm sure people can point to officials in their own community who have been in, in their office for for plenty of time. Um, so I don't really find the turnover excuse a great excuse for not trying possibility, although I, I know it's a friction. Um, I do think one of the antidotes to it is 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 for public leaders knowing their term they are you know they they're, they have a short term they might not get reelected they might be turned out is to get started quickly get started quickly don't wait the two or three or four years for the planning now you're out of office now the energy is gone again to our earlier conversation now the problems changed get going I mean if you're really worried about continuity then get going I appreciate that you know Rebecca I want you to maybe weigh in on that too because the Miami Foundation. Did a beautiful job creating a lot of conversations around what was about to be significant turnover in our own county commission almost half of the county commission turned over mostly due to term limits uh mitchell so rebecca any thoughts on that and thank you for being in that space and creating conversations from our southernmost homestead to aventura Thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, so on our end, and I know there's people tuning in from a couple of different communities, uh, most locals here are a bit mystified by who does what. We have so many we have local mayors, and we have a county mayor, we have commissioners in cities, and then also for the county. 
people are not clear what decisions are being made by whom, when, and kind of tune out at times, or just don't feel like they have a voice uh, in their civic process here. And so our aim in this upcoming, uh, in the most recent election was to profile all of the candidates running and help people understand, you have a local election coming up, most of your quality of life uh, factors are actually decided by these individuals, know who they are, vote for someone who represents your values, learn when they're making decisions that impact you. I think we had like 75,000 locals tune in for those forums, which made me proud to see people were, were paying attention. Uh, and so I just, I think it's our responsibility uh, in leadership to make sure people continue to um, have their voice represented by their leaders. Uh, we launched something this morning with our county mayor. It's gonna be the largest issues focused survey our county's ever seen, where we're asking locals, what do you want the direction of your county to be? Weigh in to help shape the direction that your mayor is gonna take for you. And I think we've become so partisan lately that like, if you didn't vote for your leader, they're, they're, they now run this county. Make sure your voice is represented in their choices now. And I appreciate that. And when I think about folks tuning in from all around, if you want to run for mayor, come to Miami-Dade County. We have 35 available. <laughs> uh, let's go back to you. It says, what would you say to someone who asserts that they are limited by legally required processes such as purchase or contract bidding? These seem like they automatically eat years of a term. Of a term. Um, the the so the see Rebecca, I, we we were, we were going to get more wonky because now we're in the procurement of uh, rules. Um, this is a fantastic question. This is one of the key uh, potentially key obstacles to possibility government. Um, so this is a really good question and and and, and another vexing one. Uh, here's my advice. First of all. Sometimes we think we're more constrained under these procurement rules, if you will, these purchasing rules in government than we really are. And by the way, sometimes in government, we think we're more constrained about lots of things than we really are because restrictions have been sort of passed down at the water cooler. Um, Jen Palka, who runs something called Coal for America and was deputy CTO uh, for the United States for, for a while, said there's these red rules and blue rules and red rules are real rules and blue rules are right, the rules that people just sort of pass around that they've heard, but they're not really rules. Um, some of the stuff that is sort of not allowed may actually be allowed if you look into the, if you look into the, um, uh, uh, if you look into the regulations. Believe it or not, I once addressed a group, uh, uh, Mark, uh, the National Association of State Procurement Officers. Okay, and I, I got asked the same question, and I said, I'll bet if you look, you can run a pilot that you don't, you haven't even thought about. Over lunch, this guy goes back, looks at his regulations, comes back, and he says, Mitch, you're right. We have permission to run pilots we didn't know about. So the rules are more permissive than sometimes people think they are. That's that's point number one. The second, and don't break the rule, don't break the real rules, right? But but break the rules that people are just passing around the water cooler. Um, secondly, uh, we do need to change in this country um, and at the local and state level some of the ways we buy stuff to solve public problems. If you are a local commissioner uh, or a mayor, you should look at how we budget and buy for possibility because right now we mostly don't, and we do need to reform. Uh, those rules and regulations so we can try new things and invest behind the ones that work. Fantastic. Thank you. By the way, that procurement group throws really great after parties. <laughs> now it says there is a difference between being open to non-traditional or non-experts ideas and letting them run the show. Can you say more about criteria you use to sort the bad ideas from the good ideas? Well, um, I can say a little bit more. Um, this is a really great question. Uh, the last, uh, in the very last part of the book, I take up this this question uh, it, itself, really, which is, how do you know the difference between possibility or delusion? And how do you know that sort of before and while you're going, and not just afterwards, when you can look back and see whether something succeeded or failed, right? I mean, I mean, this is a great question. Uh, how do we know? How do we know? And how do we know earlier rather than later? And uh, I actually think there are a number of, uh, of pitfalls we can avoid if we, if we follow the guidelines I sort of lay out in the book around, uh, around making sure we, we distinguish between possibility and delusion. Um, it starts with motives, right? You can be, you, you know, what are people's motives for getting involved? Um, it starts with proximity, uh, as I alluded to, and Brian Stevenson of getting close to the problem. Uh, Rebecca said, listen to the community. I think that's key. Um, but there's a whole there's a whole long list. I won't go through all of them. I will say that I think at the very beginning, the filter needs to be sort of wider wider than it is. Like don't have it don't have it wound too tight because we need more ideas. And it actually is hard to distinguish good ideas from bad ones at the very at the very seed. You know, 
people will, will be very dismissive of lots of new ideas. J uh, James March, who was this very famous sociologist who I describe in the book, had this uh, phrase, which I love, which is he says, I think we need to be impatient with old ideas and patient with new ideas. And I think that's true. So while I think we need to find ways to distinguish, and I lay out uh, about two dozen of them in the back of the book, don't be too, don't be, don't rush to sort them out at the very beginning, because otherwise uh, we won't have any, any new solutions at all. Thank you. This question is from Ron Dorsey. It says, Happy New Year, Mitch. How do you challenge government to take intersectional approaches? Many solutions don't live in resources and policy silos. How do we create the habit of experimenting in the places where those silos meet? It's a good question, Ron, and Ron always has good questions um, and led a lot of this intersection, uh, these work at these intersections in Boston. Um, I, I think we have to basically, uh, Rebecca said at the top, you know, possibility mindset doesn't just belong in government. It can belong anywhere and everywhere. And I do hope that we can we can all be more inventive in the public, the private, the, the sort of social spaces where these where these solutions uh, uh, get solved. I mean, to Ron's point, all the all the topics we've discussed, topics we've discussed, housing, health. Uh, Rebecca said, you know, digital access. All of it is at this intersection. Um, I, I think we have to invite everybody towards possibility, not lay it at the feet of just one sector. The last thing we should do is say private sector, you, you be more inventive or, or, you know, social sector, you be the inventors. All three of us have to work together. Um, and then Ron, I think, and you, you've been a great champion of this. I think the other thing is we need to raise expectations. We need to say these problems must be solved and they can be solved. We need to raise everyone's eyes to solving them. And I think that will do um, actually wonders for getting the people at those intersections to work together. If we really commit uh, more than we have to saying this stuff is is doable. If we work together more inventively, I think we'll make progress. Very nice. I'll do one last call for any questions that folks might like to put in the chat and uh, ask for you to put that there now. Rebecca, anything that uh, has popped to mind as we've gone through these questions that you didn't get to ask Mitchell in your first discussion? Oh, I'm thinking also back to our pregame chat and some of our favorite discussions in there as well. I mean, I've really enjoyed uh, the topics below. Do you feel like there's a part of this book that you didn't get to get into in our discussions today that you've talked about in other cities that you want to make sure we hear about? Yes. One of the issues which people ask a lot about is sort of how do you um, how do you think about all these new technologies that are showing up in cities? You know, back in the day, it was car sharing and then it was home sharing, which I write about in the book. Uh, then it was robot cars, which I write about in the book. And now it's going to be um, uh, drone drone deliveries, all this new stuff coming into cities. Um, and how should we think about as public leaders or the public about whether it should be uh, okay? I mean, I remember uh, my my father uh, was was in Austin, and all the, the when the dockless bike sharing and scooter sharing was coming to be, and he was sort of like, "These scooters are everywhere. Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What should I make of that?" And so. Um, you know, people ask like, should we regulate these companies, Rebecca? You know, should we regulate these companies in the way into town? And I have a somewhat controversial view on that, which is I, I don't actually think in, in many instances we should regulate them the instance they show up, even though some of the ones that have shown up already have led to congestion or led to other, you know, like car sharing, uh, Uber, I think needed more background checks, needed a whole host of things. And, and to this day has, has led to a, tra a real tragedy, a real tragedy among uh, taxi drivers, which has never been reckoned with. So I, I think these things have created real problems that need to be dealt with. I'm just saying, I don't know that we should, should essentially take the sins of the, of the first generation and basically in some ways punish the next generation. I think we should, I think we should more often than not, and again, this is controversial and not universal, we should allow some of these things to unfold, um, see the kind of benefits they bring, see the kind of costs they bring, and then regulate them. So I, I'm a deep believer that you can actually um, be against regulation and for it. I don't think it's hypocritical. People are wondering what we should do about you know big tech these days. I think there are aspects of it which should be regulated, but I, I don't think that actually means we should then go pre-regulate sort of all the, the new things that might be might be up and coming. That's that's a question I get asked a lot. Well, you're reminding me of the conversation about our, our Miami, the city of Miami mayor launched last week in his state of the city address, a uh, fully digital city hall, which I thought was really cool. And what you reminded me of, I'm curious, Mark, in your neighborhood, did they um, pilot the scooters last year? We did. We actually did a very elongated pilot that went from six to 12 to 18 months and with a number of different vendors. But uh 
been very interesting because there are certain no fly zones, if you will, for scooters, but everywhere else, fair game. Yeah, I mean, we, we struggle here with public transit infrastructure and it's gonna be very expensive for us to get where we wanna be as a city. And so scooters seemed like, you know, if you can pick up a scooter anywhere, leave it anywhere, like potential mobility solution for our community. Uh, but then what happens when you don't regulate it and every time you're trying to walk somewhere, you're tripping over a scooter and, you know, how do you make sure people still have what we wanna promise, which is accessible sidewalks uh, so that if you're in a wheelchair, you can still get where you're trying to go or other things. And so um, there's been, you know, quite the debate as to how open we should be. And I think there's lovers and haters on this one. Oh, that's I think, a great question and a good spot. Sorry, Mitchell, go ahead. No, no, I, and we're gonna continue. We've, we've faced that question uh, for all of our history. Whenever new things have come to be, or one of my colleagues uh, has written about, you know, they mentioned life insurance. You know, people thought it was gonna basically mean that everybody started offering their, their spouses and things. I mean, whenever new things have come to be, um, people have worried about them and they and 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 they should right um new, new things have uh intended and unintended consequences that create problems in the world we should be attuned to those i'm not arguing we should turn a blind eye to those i'm just saying they need to be balanced with an open eye towards what are the problems that th those things might actually help us solve i mean i was thinking um just today about there's a there's a woman i mentioned in the book um dr agnes Beniguajo, who was the head of uh the health ministry in rwanda and who helped basically welcome um uh, zipline drones to Rwanda to help actually do blood delivery by drones and, and actually anti-venom uh, delivery by drones in, in areas that weren't all that accessible by, um, you know, in, in, in traditional ways. And, you know, that's controversial. Um, when I asked her about it, I said, oh, you're this public entrepreneur. She said, well, of course I am. You know, she sort of was nonplussed. But, you know, people think, why would you do that? Why would you try that in, in, in Rwanda? Why would you try in Ghana? Well, now what are they doing? They're looking at how to deliver what by drone vaccine. So, I mean, sometimes we have to basically give some of this stuff permission to get going a little bit. We have to try it in fair and equitable ways. Um, uh, you, you need to make sure you're not trying it on marginalized communities and societies. Uh, I, I write about some of that in the book, but, but I do think we need to try things uh, more than we sometimes uh, do. So we're right nearing the top of the hour. And so I wanna give each of you an opportunity for some, some final thoughts and uh, also share with you in the, uh, in the chat that there's just a lot of praise for the book, praise for this conversation and lots of thanks. Folks very appreciative of that. Um, I think this is a quote from Deval Patrick. I don't know if he's on the Zoom with us, <laughs> but I did see him on your dust jacket. It says in a sector crying out for innovation, but where politics punishes failure, Mitchell Weiss shows us how and why thoughtful risk-taking public policy and government is the path to a hopeful future. Very nice thought. So Mitchell, final words, and then Rebecca will let you sign off as well. Well, I'll end with a thank you and an invitation. So first of all, thank you, Mark, and uh, the Coral Gables Chamber of Commerce. I really appreciate it. And Rebecca, um, it's so great to see you and interlock you with you. And I'm so proud of you and what you're doing at the Miami Foundation. Um, so thank you for doing this uh, with me. Um, it meant a lot. Uh, I get energy from you. Uh, to Books and Books, I'm so grateful for you hosting me in this community where so much of my family lives and friends. Um, and I guess an invitation. Uh, at the end of the book, I tell the story when I went back to the Boston Marathon finish line and I saw this woman holding a sign, I'm um, at the start line, really the marathon that says, you know, you're, er you know, you're already running faster than our government. And she was depressed about her government and she was trying to encourage us to, you know, run faster. But I want to encourage her, get off the sidelines, put down your cardboard sign, uh, help, in, uh, help in government. We all get the government we invent. We all need to do this together. And uh, so I just leave everybody with a giant invitation uh, towards possibility. Beautiful, Rebecca. I love it. So uh, my most important teammate, uh, Julissa, who's my assistant at the Miami Foundation, starts my day every day uh, by reminding me that no one ever regrets being courageous. And I feel like this book really spoke to me because you're pushing us, you push me in the philanthropic space, you push our elected leaders and us as, as residents uh, to hold a courageous bar for our government. And so I just really appreciate you uh, putting this out exactly in a moment where we need courage in our public uh, innovation. So thank you. And thanks to everyone who tunes in and to Books and Books for being who you are in our community. We really value you. That's awesome. And I wanna thank both of you for being courageous as well. Don't forget, you can get a great copy of this book at Books and Books. You can go directly to our wonderful independent and locally owned bookstore, or you can click that little green bar beneath the three of us and they will get it out to you straight away. Thanks again to our partners at the Miami Foundation, at Books and Books, of course, our friends at Harvard Business Review Press, 
On behalf of our Coral Gables Chamber of Commerce and our great partners at First Citizens Bank, Sarah Hernandez and the team, thanks to all of you for making time over lunch today to enjoy our We the Possibility a virtual lunch. Mitchell, thank you. Rebecca, thank you. Have a great day, everybody, and a great weekend.